Good morning. I'm Stephen Choi, a professor at NYU Law School and co-director of the NYU Pollock Center. I'd like to welcome everyone today to our event honoring the 40th anniversary of the Supreme Court's Chiarella versus United States decision. This event is jointly sponsored by the Indiana University Mara School of Law, the NYU Pollock Center, and the SEC Historical Society. I would like to thank Anat Carmi Weichmann and Peter Robau at the Pollock Center for all their efforts in putting together this event, and Jane Cobb of the SEC Historical Society for her support. And I would like to, of course, thank Donna Nagy, a professor at the Indiana University Mars School of Law, who is really the driving force behind this event. Now, we are a little over 40 years since the Supreme Court's Chiarella decision. The framework today for the regulation of insider trading starts with Section 10B of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 and SEC Rule 10B-5. Under that framework, not every trade based on a non-public material informational advantage is problematic. There must be fraud, or put another way, some manipulative or deceptive device. Insider trading is a fraud of omission. But for an omission to be a fraud, the wrongdoer must have a duty to disclose. A duty to disclose. We know now that this duty to disclose in the insider trading context arises from a relationship of trust and confidence or similar such relationship. Now there are questions that courts have wrestled with in the years after Chiarella about when exactly there is a duty to disclose arising from a relationship of trust and confidence. For example, if I misappropriate information from a third party source and trade with a counterparty based on this information, does this count? If I receive a tip from a tipper who owes such a duty, but I do not directly, and I trade based on the tip, does this count? If I receive information from a family member in trade, does this violation of a family relationship of trust and confidence count? While there's been a lot of case law on the question of when there is a duty to disclose, let's return to the beginning. Chiarella was the watershed case that addressed the issue of whether Rule 10b-5 liability required a duty to disclose arising from a relationship of trust and confidence in the first place. Vincent Chiarella was an employee of a financial printer, Pandic Press. The acquirer in a series of corporate takeovers had hired the printer to create announcements related to takeover bids. While information on the identity of the target companies was hidden, Chiarella was able to deduce the identity of the targets from the information in the announcements. Perhaps realizing that the stock price of a target company in a takeover typically goes up after announcement of the takeover, Chiarella purchased stock of the targets prior to the announcements, making $30,000 in profits. Importantly, Chiarella had no prior relationship with the target companies or their selling shareholders. Put another way, he was a stranger. Nonetheless, Chiarella was indicted and convicted in a jury trial. The Second Circuit affirmed Chiarella's conviction. In its affirming opinion, the Second Circuit wrote, and let me quote here, anyone, corporate insider or not, who regularly receives material non-public information may not use that information to trade in securities without incurring an affirmative duty to disclose. The Second Circuit went on to say that the securities laws, quote, created a system providing equal access to information necessary for reasoned and intelligent investment decisions. Now, this is what some refer to as the equal access theory. So the notion prior to Chiarella 
was out there that unequal access to particular kinds of information, such as non-public, corporate information, could give rise to a duty to disclose and Rule 10b-5 liability for anyone, including a stranger like Chiarella, regardless of their relationship to the company and the company's shareholders. The Supreme Court overturned Chiarella's conviction and reversed the Second Circuit. Regardless of policy arguments about what information advantage to allow or disallow in the market, Section 10b and Rule 10b-5 require fraud. The court held that for purposes of Section 10b and Rule 10b-5, the element required to make silence fraudulent is a duty to, duty to disclose. Moreover, this is not a generalized duty to all participants in market transactions. Instead, it focuses on specific relationships between two parties, whether there is a relationship of trust and confidence. Because the jury instructions in Chiarella's criminal trial did not specify that the jury must find such a duty to disclose, the court reversed Chiarella's conviction under Section 10b and Rule 10b-5. One of the concurring opinions in Chiarella presented what we now refer to as the misappropriation theory. The possibility for purposes of Rule 10b-5 liability that a person trading in securities based on non-public, material information violated a different kind of duty to disclose involving a different kind of relationship, not to the counterparties in the transaction, but instead to the source of the information. We can imagine, for example, a newspaper reporter taking information from her employer, the newspaper, the source, and trading the securities of companies covered by the newspaper based on the information. So the source of the information is separate from the company whose securities are being traded, as in Chiarella. There are many potential third-party sources of information relevant to the trading of securities. The majority in Chiarella sidestepped the misappropriation theory, stating that it did not have to decide the merits of the theory because the jury that convicted Chiarella was not presented the misappropriation theory. Now, what I've summarized on the Chiarella case is what we typically cover in a law school class. But what we don't cover is how exactly did the majority in the Supreme Court get to its position on Rule 10b-5 and the importance of the duty to disclose arising from a specific relationship between parties. This is something that Professor Donna Nagy has written on recently in an excellent law review article that is available on the SEC Historical Society's website, as well as the Pollock Center website for this event. And I encourage everyone to take a look at her article. In thinking about how the majority in Chiarella got to its position, there are important questions and what role did the defense attorneys and the attorneys at the SEC and the DOJ have in formulating and presenting theories of how Rule 10b-5 applies to insider trading. What choices were made in deciding to appeal Chiarella to the Supreme Court? And how did all these choices result in the Chiarella Supreme Court opinion? After the Chiarella decision, how did attorneys at the SEC and DOJ respond? I'm looking forward to finding out answers to these questions in today's event. I'll now turn it over to Professor Donna Nagy, who will moderate the first panel, which is on the Chiarella prosecution and Supreme Court litigation. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'll now invite our first group of panelists to turn on their cameras. It is my great honor and privilege to be moderating a discussion among three of our country's most distinguished white collar criminal defense attorneys. By way of a very brief introduction, I'll share only their current positions as well as their individual roles in the Chiarella case. We'll hear first from John Rusty Wing, now a member of Lankert, Siffer, 
and Wall Law Firm. But from 1971 to 1978, he was chief of the Securities and Business Fraud Unit for the Southern District of New York's U.S. Attorney's Office. We'll also be hearing from John S. Sifford, co-founding member of Lankler, Sifford and Wall and an adjunct professor at NYU School of Law. But from 1974 to 1979, he was assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. He prosecuted the Chiarella case and successfully argued the Second Circuit appeal. Toward the end of our panel, we'll be joined by Stanley S. Arkin, founding member of Arkin Sabakin LLP and a founding member of the Arkin Group. He represented Vincent Chiarella at his criminal trial and Second Circuit appeal and argued successfully on behalf of his client before the United States Supreme Court. Before he joins us, though, I'm delighted that I'll have a few video clips from a recent interview with Stanley. Finally, Judge Jed Rakoff will be joining the webinar for the second panel. He was Rusty Wing's successor in 1978 as fraud unit chief. Before I launch us in to what I know will be a fascinating discussion, I wanna offer two preliminaries. The first is a heartfelt tribute to SEC Historical Society co-founder and longtime SEC solicitor, Paul Gonson. Paul passed away last April, but had been very much looking forward to participating on this panel it was Paul's tremendous encouragement and enthusiasm that initially inspired me to research the Chiarella backstory. I'm truly grateful, and I know he is sorely missed by so many of our viewers today. I also want to spend just a minute on what I hope will be one of the webinar's principal takeaways. As someone who has taught and written about insider trading law for more than 25 years, I often emphasize to my students and readers that insider trading law is judicially created. Insider trading law is judge made. But it must my work on this Chiarella history project that underscores for me what is lacking or incomplete with that shorthand description. The description of insider trading law as judge made does not account for the essential role played by prosecutors and defense attorneys in framing the arguments on which the judicial rulings are based. I hope these essential roles become vividly clear to all of you in the course of this panel discussion. So with that, I will turn to Rusty Wing first for a series of questions about the Southern District of New York's fraud unit in the 1970s. Rusty, could you please start off with some background information about the Southern District of New York's fraud unit and its formation? Sure. The um, unit was initiated uh, many years before I arrived in the office by Robert Morgenthau, who was then the U.S. Attorney. Um, and at the time I was there and serving as the chief of the unit, it had, um, I would, I think, objectively say some of the finest lawyers in the office were in that unit. And that was in part because the cases in the unit were both very substantial, com complex, often high profile cases of fraud generally. And the defense lawyers in those cases were the best in the business. So you needed very trained, good, experienced trial lawyers to be able to go up against these very experienced defense lawyers. Well, and we'll be hearing from some of them today. Um, so what do you recall um, in the unit? When do you recall in the unit first discussing the possibility of bringing a criminal action under SEC Rule 10b-5 for insider trading? Well, my recollection um, does not go as far back as I'm going to start, uh, but I have, I've had the benefit in preparing for the program of some conversations with Ira Lee Sorkin, all, well known as Ike Sorkin, who used to be at the SEC and then came and joined the U.S. Attorney's Office and went very quickly into the fraud unit, given his, his knowledge of securities law. And 
he recalls that back when he first joined the office, before Bob Fisk was the U.S. attorney, I think Mike Seymour was the U.S. attorney, he recalls talking with either Seymour or Seymour's successor, Paul Kern, about an idea he had that there were a substantial number of insiders or others trading on material non-public information right before earnings information on the 10Q. And he got Seymour to uh, uh, provide him with a high school student who assisted in some research where they looked at for a number of 20 companies um, trading two weeks before the release of earnings and two weeks after. And Ike found an enormous disproportion of heavy trading in the two weeks before, either buying or selling, and then the reverse trading, either selling or buying as soon as the stock had either gone up or down in the two weeks after the trading. Unfortunately, or I don't know whether it's fortunate or not, but <laughs> neither Seymour nor Curran, and he also thought he would have talked with, with Bob Morvillo or um, uh, Tom Edwards, who were chiefs of the criminal division at the time. No one apparently said, go ahead, let's look into this. Ike doesn't recall talking to me. I don't recall talking to Ike. <laughs> I'm sure we talked. I'm positive yeah, we talked. Sure. And, and then we started looking. Ike left in 1976 before the Chiarello case started. Mm -hmm. um, but we looked at Katie Roberts in 1961, the SEC commission's opinion, which in its initial sentence says, this is a case of first impression. And that was a, a, a case where they did find that you could impose a duty on someone who wasn't a, a, a natural insider, mm -hmm. a director, officer, et cetera. Uh, yeah. when, when that particular person was, was trading uh, on the benefit, having received, uh, had a special relationship was the term in the opinion that they received insider, inside information about what was going on in the company. Um, yeah, so, uh, so if we can uh, go to, so the SEC settled its case against Chiarella in May of 1977. Uh, Chiarella consented to an injunction and agreed to disgorge his ill-gotten gain of about $30,000. The settlement was reported in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I believe soon after that, the uh, fraud unit began contemplating the possibility of proceeding with a criminal case against Chiarella. What, what do you recall of that decision making? Well, I recall it based on Katie Roberts and the subsequent Second Circuit decision, Texas Gulf Supper also expanding the, the concept that anyone who has material non-public information should be prohibited from trading unless it's unless the facts are disclosed. Mm -hmm. So we thought we should bring a case. Um, it seemed that uh, Chiarello had all the right uh, elements uh, to do and he basically he'd settled the case and acknowledged <clears throat> to some extent his wrongdoing. And Bob Fisk, who was then the US attorney was very much in agreement and thought we should go ahead. There was some discussion, should we wait until we have a case with a more high profile corporate director or officer of a company and decided we didn't need to wait. We could go forward just as it is. And so um, another assistant, Jack Lowe, got an indictment, which was returned around January 4th of 1978. And um, he was then due to leave the office and he did promptly. And as a result, we, uh, John Sifford, one of the great trial lawyers of the office came in and tried the case. Okay, well, th well thank you for that sort of early uh, history here. Um, so as, as, as Rusty has said, uh, January, 1978, uh, an indictment is filed. Vincent Chiarella hired Stanley Arkin as his attorney to defend against the criminal securities fraud charges. Um, in a recent interview, Stanley shared with me his recollections of his initial impressions of the case, as well as his initial hope of potentially resolving the case without a criminal trial. So I'm delighted to share with you all just a short video clip now of that interview. And uh, I remember speaking to John Shifford about could we make a deal? <clears throat> 
I wanted a misdemeanor. And he was very uh, much against that, wouldn't do it. Nor would the people he worked with. Jed Rakoff is now a federal judge. He came a long time, he's a long time friend. And Bob Fisk, who was U.S. attorney, is a long time friend. And I remember that uh, I was unable to persuade him to move. And I thought to myself, this case, it's the first insider criminal case. And he's brought it on one theory. And I remember speaking to Mark Harrison, who was just by then working for me. And we had a wonderful experience on Point Dexter, which was an acquittal. I always consider acquittals third only after my children, my marriage, and then acquittals. And I remember when the case came in that I had a first impression, which I shared with Mark and we talked about it, which was who was hurt? Who was hurt? Criminal case, somebody should be hurt. Now you had a civil case and that couldn't be used as a precedent against you. Because if it had been, we would have lost for sure, lost all the way for sure. And you know, I realized that it would be a hard case to try because this man made money uh, by using somebody else's information. And then I said to myself and to Mark, uh, how was that person hurt? Because he bought in the open market. And even though I do understand that I learned this from you, that over half the volume on a couple of days is when he bought his shares. But I said, who did he set out to hurt and who was actually hurt? Would have been a, shareholder who never would have known the difference and it would have been an anonymous shareholder. And so there was something there we could, we, could, we could fight about. And of course, as I got more into the case and into the law, and we got into the obligations, the uh, way you owed certain fealty when you were in that area, but it still always was an open, an open channel. It just somehow what he did at that time didn't make it a crime. And yeah. I, under, I understand that John and his office had some time coming up with a theory they had in their indictment. So John, Stanley's clip packed in a lot of important information. So I'm eager to ask you a host of questions. So can you begin by telling us about your first encounter with Stanley as Chiarella's counsel? Two, two quick uh, preludes to that. Uh, first, um, I, I have to tell you, listening to Professor Choi, uh, every time I hear someone talk about Chiarella, I learn something new and thank you for the clarity in which you said that. I also, while thanking people, need to reiterate uh, my thanks to the Pollock Center uh, at NYU and to uh, uh, the Mauer, Mauer School of Law at Indiana University and to the SEC Historical Society for putting this on and for inviting me. Uh, and especially Donna for you and for your perseverance in, in putting this together. Um, my first encounter with Stanley uh, actually uh, has dictated a 41 year friendship unlike any other that I have uh, uh, in the law. Um, we were in court on the arraignment. I had inherited the case from Jack Lowe as Rusty explained and um, uh, the judge turned to me and said, uh, Mr. Sifford, what is your legal theory uh, for this novel case? And I, I, I essentially said what Rusty said. It was that um, this is prohibited. It's material, non-public information. You either uh, uh, have a duty to disclose or you abstain. Market is for equal access. That's our legal theory. 
And he then turned to Judge Owen, then turned to Stanley and said, Mr. Arkin, I know you don't have to tell me, but what is, it would help me in devising the charge to the jury, what is your legal theory? And hesitating for a moment, Stanley said, Your Honor, it's the Rachmanis defense. Now, Rachmanis is a Yiddish expression for sympathy or compassion. And um, that was the end of the session as I remembered it. Uh, I went back to my office and about three hours later, I get a call from Stanley saying, John, you won't believe this. The law clerk to Judge Owen just called me asking me for the citation to United States against Rachmanis. <laughs> now, why, why Stanley thought that I, this uh, uh, nice Jewish boy who was taught not to look Jewish or act Jewish, would know what Rachmanis meant, I don't know, but he did. And, and th thereafter, I realized that Stanley had this special quality to him where he could enjoy a good laugh. And when he came to me asking for a misdemeanor, I guess he didn't know me very well because I, in fact, agreed with him. And I guess I played it very, very straight and, uh, and, and camouflaged it. And I went to Fisk. I remember going quickly to the eighth floor and saying, look, we have a novel theory. Um, why don't we get a criminal conviction uh, by, by, by a guilty plea with misdemeanors? The first step, we have someone who's merely a printer, you know, made only $30,000 for goodness sakes, had been earning $23,000 or so a year. And, um, uh, we should go after the big guy. I think I said Harold Janina, IT&T. And, um, and, and Fisk then, with his methodical and careful self, said, well, there's really overwhelming, powerful evidence of, 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 of misuse and guilty knowledge here. Uh, here we have uh, the printing industry, which was rampant with use, misuse of, uh, of client information. There were printers were stealing information. Uh, it wasn't like overhearing information at a football game. The SEC had charged a printing company, Sorg, with doing this before. They had settled, Sorg had settled. Notices had gone out to all of the Sorg employees. Other companies adopted those notices and noticed, they notified their, their, their employees. At Pandic Press, their employees knew that it was not only wrong to do against public company policy, it was wrong because the SEC had charged it. Uh, we'll never get, a, the union had bought into this uh, and sent out bulletins. Um, there would be no better case of notice uh, than this, uh, that it's wrong. And I think once you get a conviction here, you can then go after Harold Janine. And that's the way I, I, that, that meeting left. Um, can I talk to the next compacted point that Stanley oh, mentioned? His, yes, his, absolutely. Which was no one was harmed. I mean, he argued that, and I and I and I and I reviewed the the summations, and in fact, I said that's a smokescreen. What's the difference between someone taking a a, a gun and pointing it at someone's head? That's pretty bad. But it, is it really harm if you take a gun and shoot it in a crowded movie theater? Because that's what he did. It may have been anonymous, but he knew it was wrong, and 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 it exposed to the same risk the the, the selling public. So so let's let's drill down a bit into the the government's legal theory. So um, how how then did you refute this this idea here um, that no one was harmed? Well, I think in 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 the first case. Uh, 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 what I did was is I called witnesses who sold their stock. Uh, and I, tr uh, I, I treated this kind of like a, a junk case, a two by junk case. Uh, this was not a, a, a victimless crime. Um, I mean, let's, let's, let's contextualize the, the, the situation. As, as, as Rusty said, we were dealing with Katie Roberts and Texas Gulf Sulphur, the SEC and the Second Circuit. The Second Circuit had made it clear that misuse of material non-public information for personal gain was not permitted. And that a, a trader who has material non-public information must disclose, and if he can't for any reason, if he's disabled, then he must abstain. Um, and the analogy that I had was that possession of MNPI, material non-public information, inside information, was like possessing heroin. 
It was the same thing. All you had to do, and in securities law, the notion of fraud was very different than 1341 or common law. There was a special duty, as Katie, Katie Roberts uh, said. Uh, so if you are dealing with securities, the whole purpose of the SEC, the commission, was to equalize the playing field, uh, create equal access. And um, people would be hurt if there was misuse of confidential information that they shouldn't be using for themselves. And, 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 and the fact that someone might have been selling their stock anyway to buy, uh, to repay their mortgage, doesn't mean that they weren't hurt. Uh, uh, they could have had more money to repay their mortgage had they known about that information and waited three days. Okay, so, so as you started to frame the case then, clearly an argument was that the target shareholders, uh, the sellers who sold without knowing tender offer information um, were harmed. Um, who additionally was harmed by Chiarella's uh, actions in the government's view? Well, um, the, the, Stanley made a motion to dismiss and in the motion to dismiss, he said there was no duty owed to the, uh, to the target company, the company whose stock was traded. And traditionally, in misrepresentation and omission cases, you have to make a misstatement about the stock that you're trading in, what its value is. Um, and uh, we had, uh, Jack Lowe had, had, had the indictment charging three prongs of the of 10b5 he, he, he engaged in a scheme to defraud he made misrepresentations or omissions of material fact and he he, he devised a scheme which had the uh, which operated as a fraud on the sellers the last theme was with prong had to do with the sellers the first two the second one the, the statement also had to do the sellers the first one did not um, it, it, it did not mention who the target, who the victim was. Um, and the defense theory was that he did not make a false statement um, and that he owed no duty to the issuing company. Um, and we essentially conceded that this was an omission case, not a statement case. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the judge during the trial came to the conclusion that in fact, it's a stretch to say that, uh, that, that you could bring an omission case in an anonymous market because um, uh, it's not clear that a, a, a statement to a broker uh, that I wanna buy would impose a duty down the line to the ultimate seller to disclose. So he struck the false statement case and the, the, the misrepresentation of an, or, or omission of a material fact part of the case. And that never was submitted to the jury. So we had engaged in a fraud and operated as a fraud on the sellers. But in the motion to dismiss, Judge Owen adopting an argument, I haven't been able to find my papers, but I, I imagine that, I, that, that this was the theory we advanced, that Judge Owen in, uh, adopted it and said that the fraud was on the sellers and it operated as a fraud on the acquiring company. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Panic Press and Panic Press's client. In effect, he was saying that a victim was um, the victim that you would articulate in a mis misappropriation theory. Yeah, that, and, and indeed there is a written opinion that right. Judge Owen issued in refusing to dismiss the indictment at this point. And I'm sorry, Junko. And he said just that. And he mm -hmm. said just that. And so in the charge to the jury at the end of the case, we had submitted our charges in advance of the trial. I submitted a supplemental charge, request number two, I think, supplemental request number two, which said uh, that, that he should say that as part of the charge. Slaying the smart lawyer that he is said that that would be an amendment of the, uh, a, 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 an amendment of the indictment. It would be a variance because the indictment charged that it operated as a fraud on the sellers. Yeah, I want, to, I want to pause there, just, just sort yeah. of capture that moment, um, because as, as we all know from the Supreme Court decision, um, the justices poured over those jury instructions, and um, the uh, stated reason that a majority of the Supreme Court was not willing at that time in 1980 
to endorse or affirm a so-called misappropriation theory when the fraud would have been on the acquiring companies, uh, when the fraud would have been on Pantic Press. Um, the reason was because there was no jury instruction specifically on the misappropriation charge. Um, exactly, exactly. So uh, not, not, not through lacking effort on your part, it sounds like. So well, it, it, don't give me too much credit because again, I was dealing with a junk case. I was dealing with material non-public information you can't sell. That, right. Um, why do you think that, that Judge was, Owen- I I'm sorry. Uh, why, do you, uh, why do you speculate or, or can you please speculate why Judge Owen uh, did not allow that specific instruction well, to the jury, because it was in his own opinion. Well, because what Stanley did was noted that the opinion said that there were two victims because it operated as it was a fraud on the sellers and it operated as, as a fraud on the, uh, on the acquiring company. The indictment said there was a fraud, no victim specified, and it operated as a fraud on the sellers. Okay. So. Yeah. So I, at the Groving Room conference, the charging conference, agreed and said that Stan is actually right. That the indictment does say what he says it says. So just flip it. Just omit the, 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 the acquiring company from the operators of fraud and add, put that with the first part. Say that it was a, he devised a scheme to defraud the acquiring company, Pandic Press and its clients, and it operated as a fraud on the sellers. And yeah. you do operate as a fraud to avoid the, the duty issue, you know, sure. the, the omission sure. problem. And, sure. and uh, Judge Owen basically uh, didn't want to go there because he saw, I, I think, I'm speculating that he said, I, I'm more afraid of the variance, amending of the indictment problem than I am of the legal theory because the legal theory, clearly we were right. I mean, Second Circuit law was that uh, this was verboten and right. it was malum in se as opposed to malum prohibitum. Right. It was, if you knew that it was narcotics and you knew that it was wrong to do it, you couldn't do it. And, and that, that it was that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's so, uh, interestingly, the Supreme court, um, ended up agreeing with Stanley's view about the fiduciary relationship that was necessary between the trader and the shareholders of the issuing corporation. But we have a while to go before getting to there. So let's let's talk about trial preparation because it's um, the, as a law professor, I spend so much time with my students in class talking about these legal theories. Um, prosecuting an insider trading case or defending an insider trading case is sort of an altogether uh, different, uh, a, a, a very different aspect that we often don't get a chance to share with our students. Um, so it's uh, January 1978, Jack Lowe has uh, presented the case to the grand jury, successfully gotten the indictment, and then leaves to go into private practice, and you get the file. And so why don't you take us from there in terms of the evidentiary gathering and um, how you went about actually proving your legal theory? Well, th th there's a difference between legal theory and themes. Okay. And, 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 and one of the clear themes from the get-go for the defense was that he had no scienter. He did not have an intent to defraud. So um, what I teach my students at NYU is you have to think backwards, start with the jury instructions, then look for the evidence, then write your summation that you'd like to be able to write and then try to find the evidence that would back it up. Uh, so that's what I did here. I, 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 I started with what the elements were and I had it from Texas Gulf Sulphur, mm -hmm. really simple. And what I needed then was the state of mind. Um, common law fraud, wire fraud required an intent to harm. Uh, securities fraud didn't in the second circuit. Dixon and, and Peltz were two cases which said you had to know that what you were doing was wrong, wrong knowingly wrongful misconduct. That's what was required in the circuit. So, uh, and Stanley was arguing that Ernst and Engel against Hockfelder, which was a civil case, uh, required an intent to defraud. Uh, we were able to persuade Judge Owen that, in fact, that did not apply because all it was saying was that negligence was not enough. Mm -hmm. um, and the trial preparation 
had to do with this issue mostly, which was, did he know that it was wrong? And that's what the bulk of my work was doing. The, the, the file I got was very, very skinny. And uh, the theory was, as, as Professor Choi said, is that, 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 that Chirella was the markup man in this printing house. And what as a markup man he did was that he would get a proposed tender offer material document and it omitted the, the name of the target. It also, because in those days it was linotype, he, like we have computers now, they had to leave the exact number of spaces open to match the number of letters of the target company when they were omitting it so that they could just slip in the name. And, but it did contain other information such as the volume, the highs and lows of the stock in the prior year, the market it traded on, and things like that. And uh, what I was told uh, uh, that the SEC had determined uh, was that he had figured out, he had used those clues to figure out wh which company the target was. And those are the stocks that he purchased in advance in his own name and in his father's name. Um, so uh, I, I could not believe that. I, I just thought that that was a crock. I thought nobody is going to sit in a room and do that and mm -hmm. figure it out uh, and use those clues. Quite so the Sudoku sure. puzzle or <laughs> crossword puzzle, which I am told by Stanley is what he thought it was. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's apparently what his hobby was. I didn't know that. Um, uh, what, what, all I knew is they took to the, the, the courtroom every day, uh, uh, opera news with him. Um, uh, he had that under his arm and he read it during the trial. Um, but, but, but what, what I, what I, what I, what I thought was that someplace along the line, the lawyers must have slipped in the actual name and that's what he figured out. Pandic Press was a very computerized company. So it had digitized the date and time stamps for every document that Chiarella ever saw, that Pandic Press ever had, and that Chiarella ever worked on. You can coordinate what he saw, what he worked on, and what was there. And by the end of the day, we had a mountain of documents from Chiarella, from, from Pandic Press that Carmen Aselta, the SEC investigator, had, had obtained for, from them for me. And indeed, Chiarella had figured it out to my mm -hmm. astonishment. Um, <laughs> and uh, in the course of this, I had discovered that uh, he had applied for unemployment insurance. And, and Martin, who is one of the, the great uh, people uh, working on this uh, behind the scenes that nobody ever sees, uh, would you put up uh, number 12, please? So I obtained, I learned that he had, had applied for and gotten uh, unemployment insurance. And in his application, which I got, was this uh, statement which says, I was discharged for violating the company rule, uh, Ray, or about disclosure of client information. The allegation is true. And um, he goes on to say that it, that it had to do with uh, uh, a matter of printing uh, stock tender offers. And I utilized information for myself. This happened last year, um, although uh, through an investigation by the SEC. And um, so you can take that down, Martin. So, so here is a confession that I, 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 I knew when I, and I turned, I think it was the, I got it the week before the trial, turned it over to Stanley and said, well, there's a, 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 um, a state law that says uh, that that's confidential. That was an issue, whether that should have been suppressed, it should have been uh, admitted into evidence or not. And that was one of Stanley's, I think the second issue on appeal. Um, and that of course has gotten totally lost in the shuffle here. No, nobody right. ever thinks about that uh, as part of this case. Um, uh, I also was able to find an employee who had, uh, to whom you know, Chirella had confessed about what he had done. Hmm. Um, and Stanley being the compassionate man that he is um, uh, and his client agreeing, agreed not to require that compatriot of, of, of Chirella to testify. And so we stipulated as to his testimony. Okay. Um, so there really was not much dispute about what happened. The issue was how could I make 
K of his state of mind. Right. So right. What I, w one of the things I did was offer into evidence in the affirmative case, um, a, a, an exhibit, which uh, Martin, if you could put up 14A, which was a, a notice. And this notice uh, was above the punching clock. Uh, now Stanley's theme in his opening and, uh, and throughout the trial cross was that he thought that this was against company policy, but company policy can't be criminalized. And he didn't know that it was a crime. Well, it does say that this is Pandic's property and it's personal, it, it can't be used uh, uh, and it's it belongs to the customer and you're forbidden. It sounds very much like a company policy. And then you go on and says, but in addition, you're liable to criminal penalties of five years in jails and $10,000 fine for each offense. Now, until yesterday, I thought that that was an accurate description of uh, the securities laws. Well, uh, a, a professor named Nagy pointed out to me yesterday that in fact, at the time, the fine for an SEC offense was not $10,000. Um, I don't know what it was exactly, but, but, but um, if she's right, the person writing this wasn't uh, uh, one of the top criminal defense lawyers who had graduated from the, the securities fraud unit that Rusty ran. Um, it, uh, well, the ten thousand dollars was a wire fraud. Um, right. Could could be linked to mail fraud and wire fraud. I believe it was a hundred thousand dollars was the top fine for uh, securities fraud. Now that's a top fine, um, but yeah, quite interesting. Um, one of the things I'd love to know is who counseled either Pantic Press or the Sorg Printing. Um, in printing, no pun intended, their sign. Um, and so uh, we will uh, see there's there's ever more research to do. But I know the time, yeah, John, is, is running short. And so I, I, I'd like uh, to talk a little bit more about maybe your, your, your closing statements to the jury and um, uh, because you were successful in convincing the jury um, to find guilty on every count. Well, the, 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 the summation largely was a recap of my cross, which essentially mm -hmm. was that, that you know, he tried to present a sympathetic uh, picture of having lost his job after 20 years. Uh, his wife had died. His sister was disabled. His father was unemployed. He earned $23,000 a year. And you know, as Stanley said, you're going to make him a felon 17 times over. Uh, that doesn't seem quite right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had to, to kind of uh, pull the teeth on the sympathy uh, and the way to do that was uh, to point out that um, he was, uh, uh, when he testified on direct, that he only thought it was against company policy, that that wasn't true. And I started with the sign. And I said, and we established that it was up for 640 times. And through wonderful uh, cross-examination, uh, really textbook where you don't care whether the witness is yes or no. Uh, because if he says yes, he confesses, and if he says no, he's not believable. He said no. He said, I never read it once. And at that, that's what the judge found constituted perjury beyond a reasonable doubt. And, sent, and for that reason, he was saying, yeah, that, that's 640 one times passing the sign and the time clock makes it into the Second Circuit opinion, the Supreme Court opinion. So that was uh, clearly something that uh, all of the judges and justices who considered the facts um, looked to. Um, I think the one minute I have, I would say the other, the other feature here is that, is that uh, he, burst, he, he, he ejaculated the notion of inside information. He said that what he was accused of in, in the unemployment insurance was violating inside information. Mm -hmm. That was a term that Stanley had prevented me from being able to mention at the trial. So it came out for the first time through him. And through a series of cross-examinations, he ended up having to confess that he knew that that was a Wall Street securities firm. And in the end, after a bunch of back and forth and resisting, he confessed that he knew that it was wrong against the SEC and not just against company policy. Um, what he never said was is that I knew that it, that the company thought it was against the, against the law, but I disagreed. Mm -hmm. And that would have been more difficult for me to deal with, but he never said that. 
Yeah, I know. Interesting that a sign says if you do this, you can be criminally prosecuted, but there had never been, um, at least under the federal securities laws or even under mail and wire fraud, a, a securities fraud case uh, for the use of material non-public information. And the, the bottom line is he, he was saying, uh, I only knew it was against company policy. I never knew it was wrong. And I was able to argue he disregarded by shooting the bullet into the crowded movie theater. He disregarded the harm it was causing. Right. And it was deliberate. So right. it was a deliberate disregard for the harm he was causing. So Stanley tried to make a fiduciary based argument involving no relationship between Chiarella and the selling shareholders. Um, Judge Owen did not accept that, and uh, the case goes to the jury. The jury votes to convict Chiarella for securities fraud on every count. Um, Judge Owen then sentences Chiarella to one month in prison and five years of probation. Um, so Rusty, I want to get you back into the conversation here. So it's, it's April 1978. Um, you were building a criminal defense practice focused on white collar crime. Um, what do you recall about the white collar criminal defense bar's reaction to Chiarella's conviction and prison sentence? I, I, I don't really recall that other than I can assume <laughs> defense lawyers, white collar defense lawyers was looking forward to more business if there were going to be criminal prosecutions of people who normally engage in insider trading, who normally can afford good lawyers. And that was probably a plus. And as a, as a former prosecutor, I was happy that the case turned out the way it turned out. Uh, sure, that uh, typical defendants um, um, might not be. Judge, uh, yeah, and, and, and what happened later, Stanley made a great argument in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in a very divided set of opinions, upheld Mr. Chiarello's, um, it rather reversed the conviction. And um, although some of the uh, concurring or dissenting opinions were very helpful in laying the groundwork for future prosecutions under a misappropriation theory. Absolutely. And actually, our second panel is going to be focusing on that. But before, before we get there, um, we have the Second Circuit then heard uh, Chiarella's appeal in October 1978 um, because Stanley, on behalf of his clients, sought an appeal of the prison sentence and uh, the conviction. Um, the Second Circuit panel voted 2-1 to affirm the conviction. Interestingly, Judge Kaufman's majority opinion stepped away a bit from the, well, perhaps even more than a bit from the broader equal access theory of Rule 10b-5 disclosure. Um, as uh, Professor Choi at the outset um, explained, the Second Circuit replaced a broad equal access with a more limited obligation applicable to only those who regularly received market sensitive information. Um, so John, you were the successful arguer before the Second Circuit. Um, I, I really wanna get to the Supreme Court argument, but, but one question about the Second Circuit appeal. In the questions by the Second Circuit judges, um, were you able to sense the reframing in this regular access uh, type argument, a narrowing of equal access to regular access or structural access? I had no, I have no recollection of thinking that. I talked to Rick Weinberg, who was my classmate and my supervisor on the appeal. He was, uh, I think, chief or deputy chief of the, of the appellate section. And, and Rick said that all he remembers from the argument is walking away thinking that we had won. Okay, and well, Stan, Stan, and you did. <laughs> and Stanley told me he walked away thinking that he had one vote for in, in his favor. Okay. I, have no, I have no memory other than thinking I did the best I could. Well, it was a 2-1 decision. Meskel did uh, side with, with Stanley, but um, you, had, uh, you had the majority. Uh, the bottom line, at least to Chiarella and to Stanley and to the prosecutors, was that Chiarella's prison sentence was upheld unless an extraordinary event were to intervene. 
Um, and in my recent interview with Stanley, he shared with me his reasons for pushing on and seeking a review of Chiarella's criminal conviction by the US Supreme Court. Typically at the appellate level, if you lose your client, sadly goes to prison. Um, but Stanley um, didn't take no for an answer. And so I'd like to share some video discussions of the reasoning. Martin, uh, put, there we go. I, I um, in my career of 57 or 58 years, uh, I always had the sensibility that you never stop fighting unless there's nothing there to fight about. And I felt here, there was something worth fighting about. It was the first case of its type, which of course gave me some encouragement in going to a higher court. And a certiorari petition um, was not so difficult to prepare, even if it had what we would have done. And I will tell you this, so, and for anybody else, you don't expect to get certiorari. <laughs> Almost nobody ever expects it, except in rare cases. Here, I thought, probably wasn't much chance, but there might be some. I remember thinking to myself, it was interesting enough to catch my mind and that of many of my colleagues, other people who do defense work and other lawyers I knew. And so I thought, well, interesting to them and to me, maybe it'd be interesting to the court. And what's preparing a certiorari petition, two or three days of hard work. And Mark Harrison and I did that together. And he is and was a wonderful lawyer and a great help. So I find that fascinating for a host of reasons. I've never prepared a cert petition. I've written amicus briefs and I can tell you it took me a whole bunch longer than two or three days uh, for my amicus briefs. Um, anyway, the Supreme Court granted the cert petition in 1979. And the government is now being represented at the Supreme Court by the Solicitor General's Office of the Department of Justice. From his SEC Historical Society oral history, we know it was Frank Easterbrook, then Deputy Solicitor General, who raised objections to the government's equal access approach to <laughs> Rule 10b-5 insider trading liability. Um, Judge Easterbrook, who was Deputy Solicitor General Easterbrook then wasn't a fan either of the Second Circuit's regular receipt narrowing either. The office opted to go all in with a misappropriation approach. Um, that is Assistant Solicitor General Stephen Shapiro and the SEC's Paul Gonson worked together to frame the arguments to center on two misappropriation theories. Um, first, Chiarella violated Rule 10b-5 by defrauding both the acquiring companies whose information he converted, so that was one, as well as the investors who sold their shares in the target companies without informational advantage that Chiarella had wrongfully obtained through misappropriation. So whereas caveat emptor might be the usual rule, if you steal information, you can't use it um, to your advantage. Uh, so that was the government's theory um, up to the Supreme Court. Um, and so John, as you think about it, what comes to mind when you recollect the government's merit brief and in particular, Steve Shapiro's Supreme Court oral argument? I can tell you that I was um, just in awe of Steve. He was a brilliant, kind, generous man and his loss uh, is with us today. He, um, he, um, it's unusual for an assistant U.S. attorney to be asked to participate in the brief writing. It's unusual for an assistant U.S. attorney's name to be on the brief or to be asked to sit at council table in the Supreme Court. Steve did that for me uh, and took me seriously. To this day, I don't know why. He was just generous to a fault and he was brilliant in the argument and he wore tails and I did not. <laughs> Well, as I was working on this essay, I've heard just such extraordinary memories of Steve Shapiro um, 
his his brilliance, uh, his kindness, his inspiration. Um, but I have I have one final clip to share with all of you from my recent interview with Stanley, when he talks about his reaction to the government's decision to go all in with the misappropriation theory. And so uh, we have one final clip. I've always had in, in my this is my entire career, well, over half a century, which is you can't commit somebody to jail or potential jail based on an afterthought. If you don't get it right in an indictment, then so be it. Maybe bad for society, but so be it. It's better for society that you have a predictable legal system and not one which waxed and waned depending on where you were at the time. Put another way, if you try a case at the district level, that's the state we're talking federally now, you can't change it on circuit level you certainly can change it at the Supreme Court level. You do it the first time around, or you got to do it again in your next case. Well, and Stanley, ultimately, uh, the Supreme Court did agree with you there. So, uh, Stanley, if you turn your camera on now, um, it, it would be it would be wonderful to hear directly from you um, on this question. Uh, your, your oral argument to the US Supreme Court was on November 5th, 1979, which is exactly 41 years ago today. Um, extraordinary coincidence because when we set our webinar date, uh, we did not have that in mind. Um, can, can you describe for us how it felt 41 years ago to be arguing your client's case before the nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court? I felt very privileged. <clears throat> we have a wonderful system in this country. And the Supreme Court, of course, is the main and most important court in the land in terms of developing legal policy and legal rules. I was very happy to do it. Um, I remember the day very, very well because I had with me uh, observing the argument, what were then my three little boys and my wife. And it was a beautiful day in Washington. And I just felt good about the argument. Uh, I didn't, if you will, plan are divine that I would win it, but I thought I had a shot. And I had great fun in the argument. And my adversary was a well-spoken, articulate fellow as well, Shakiro. But I thought the argument went very, very well. And I also will say to you that um, I've never really been very nervous in a courtroom. And I thought I might be there. I was not. It was a, just a wonderful professional experience and also made me feel very good about this country again as I do almost every day. I mean every day except maybe lately in the last few <laughs> few weeks with what's going on but this is a wonderful place to be. We built a wonderful society and legal system and just one more thing to say which is that sure. I've been I've been practicing uh, criminal law and other kinds of difficult cases for more than half a century all over the country and I believe all over the world. And I've had cases really everywhere, and interesting cases. And one impression I have I should share with you is Randy and John are there that never dealt with an office anywhere in the country or a law enforcement group anywhere else in the world which had as uniformly talented, good people as the Southern District of New York. Now there are some exceptions I can recall, but I won't mention those. But as an organization, as a law enforcement group, it's one to be proud of in our country. They are just an excellent group. John and Rusty, the wonderful lawyers they are, are among those graduates. I'm one of the few people in town 
whom I would say practiced and have practiced still successfully, happily, with marvelous cases. I never was a prosecutor, except in one limited area, which I won't bother to mention where I was retained by the court to pursue some bad people. But it was an experience which from start to finish was one which was a very satisfying one professionally. Vincent was not a bad man. Vincent was a sweethearted man who made little money. And I think that he first looked at this as kind of a game. He knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong from start to finish. And by the way, I always leave you with one thought. This is no reflection on my good friend, John or Rusty or anybody else. I never understood why they charged it the way they did. It would have been very simple to charge this as a mail fraud and misappropriation. It would have been done, it would have been no appeal. Um, but then all of our securities regulation professors would not have uh, Chiarella versus United States as one of our, our, our key cases. It would have been a criminal law case in a white collar crime class rather than a securities fraud case in securities regulation. Um, I, I, I will say, having listened to the oral argument and for our viewers out there, it's easily accessible just Googling oral argument Chiarella will bring you to various websites. Um, Stanley's argument was brilliant. Stephen Shapiro's argument was brilliant. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, St Stanley managed to convince six of the justices to vote in favor of reversing Chiarella's conviction. Um, and uh, Five of those justices uh, squarely supported um, the, the fiduciary based view um, that one needs a disclosure duty that is based on a fiduciary relationship of trust and confidence. Um, so Stanley, you, you didn't convince uh, Judge Owen of that at the district court level and you didn't convince the second circuit, but when the going uh, was all important, um, you won the case on behalf of your client. Um, we know that the jury instructions, John, that you tried to get in were not given because of Judge Owen's decision making um, regarding what could have been a misappropriation theory. And so we have only about a minute left. Rusty, I, I'll just sort of go back to you on the last word. And you sort of, um, you alluded to this in your last statement. Um, that uh, as one of the criminal prosecutors who initiated the case, the case is now reversed by the Supreme Court. Um, what, what was your thinking at the time? You never feel good when you think a case that should, should have gone all the way uh, and the conviction upheld doesn't do that, particularly when it's a case where you're essentially making new law or trying to do it and you think you're right. So you, obviously you don't like it. Bob is saying we won the case in the district court and the solicitor lost it. I'm not sure you couldn't also say Judge Ward, um, uh, Judge Owen, not Judge Ward, Judge Owen lost it because his opinion dismissing Stanley's pretrial motion to, to uh, dismiss the indictment focused on the fact that this was an embezzlement from the acquiring company, essentially. And although you could argue about whether there was sufficient language in the indictment, I think in his ruling initially, he found there was sufficient language in the indictment to cover the misappropriation theory, Pandek Press, all the way up to the acquiring companies. And yeah. so maybe he was the one who lost it for us all. But Stanley did a great job. John did a great job. And you and running this have done a terrific job. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Rusty. I should say that Chief Justice Berger found the jury instructions did cover misappropriation. And Chief Justice Berger and Justice Marshall and Justice Blackman um, would, would, have, uh, would have found the jury sufficient charges uh, to affirm the conviction. Um, so, um, well, I truly wish we had another hour to continue this conversation. Um, I could probably spend the rest of the day talking with John and Rusty and Stanley. 
Um, but we have three additional panelists planning to talk about their roles in SEC and DOJ enforcement strategies in the wake of the Chiarella decision. Uh, Professor Robert Thompson of Georgetown University Law Center will be the second panel moderator. So with tremendous and with heartfelt thank you to Stanley and to Rusty and to John uh, from all of us, um, I'll now turn this webinar over to Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. You've done a wonderful job of putting together this program with Steve Choi and the Pollock Center and Jane Cobb and the SEC Historical Society. You made it possible to preserve the story of this pivotal point in the development of law of insider trading and we're all, we all benefit. Uh, our, um, our three participants for this panel had key roles in that Chiarella saga while they were still in their 30s and for one even earlier, I think he was 12. <laughs> Since then, they've all had distinguished careers and they're in three different parts of the securities legal world. Some, something like the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker of children's nursery rhymes. Don Langbord took the academic route. He is the Thomas Aquinas Reynolds Professor of Law at Georgetown, widely acknowledged as the go-to scholar among all those writing on insider trading. At the time covered by our story this morning, uh, he had come from Harvard and Louis lost his class on the Federal Securities Code to Wilma Cutler and then to the General Counsel's Office at the SEC. Uh, Lee Richards, who will go second in our panel, was an assistant United States Attorney for the Southern District in New York, and he tried the Newman case soon after Chiarella decision that became the center point for working out what the reshaped world of insider trading would look like. Uh, he left the prosecutor's office for private practice starting his own form, firm, Richards Kibbe and Orby, uh, for a practice that truly merits the Lifetime Achievement Award that he was awarded from the New York Law Journal. Uh, Jed Rakoff illustrates the judicial path of the post Chiarella time. Uh, as the federal judge in the Southern District of New York, he has decided important questions of war and peace, but more relevant to our topic, he has written more decisions on insider trading than any other judge of our time. At the time of our story, he was head of the fraud unit of the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, for the Southern District, succeeding Rusty. Uh, that time span covers the Chiarella trial itself, uh, as well as the Newman trial that, that we'll talk about here. Uh, in the interim between his time as a prosecutor and his time as a judge, he was in private practice, which took him into another branch of key insider trading cases, U.S. versus Carpenter, and in which he was on the, descent, he was on the defense side. So we have a real treat uh, in store for us at, at this time. Uh, as the curtain rises for what will be act two, the nine rogue justices have handed down their decision in the Marble Temple on East Capitol and First Street. And the scene, and the scene shifts a, a few blocks across town to a more pedestrian office building where the SEC moves into immediate action. Uh, and that's where Don picks up the story. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I should say I was sufficiently junior at the time that my recollections today are very much fly on the wall recollections. Uh, but it was a privilege to be able to be in on this discussion of insider trading as it emerged. I wanna go back a couple of years before I come to the question Bob posed. You heard in panel number one that the criminal prosecution um, of Vincent Chiarella drew heavily from Texas Gulf Sulphur and the notion of parity of information, parity um, equality. Um, and that is indeed the case. Um, at the SEC, however, shortly after Texas Gulf Sulphur, there came a recognition that that would be a dangerous and somewhat misleading theory on which to proceed. And you find nothing in the decade before the Supreme Court Chiarella's decision that shows a strong SEC embrace of it. In fact, in 1976, Phil Loomis, who had argued Texas Gulf Sulphur, uh, 
and was then general counsel of the SEC, gave a speech to an investment analyst society saying equality of access is both bad law and bad policy. And no one understanding the securities markets could think that by itself um, would suffice as a theory. Uh, unfortunately, the SEC was not communicating that terribly well, uh, as opposed, you know, apart from behind closed doors. Um, so for the remainder of the decade, uh, the SEC was at work trying to figure out a better way of articulating, um, a duty-based way. And so it was something of a slap when the Supreme Court ultimately says, we could not decide this case without creating a parity of information regime, which we are not prepared to do. In fact, lots of brilliant minds had been working on exactly how to do that. And frankly, um, and Judge Rakoff will no doubt get into this, had come to the conclusion that maybe it would be better if we had a statutory or rule-based articulation of the prohibition rather than continuing going on with the open-ended 10b5, a, B, and C um, that ha ha had been the law. A lot of this was driven by um, Louis Loss uh, and the group that was formed under the auspices of the American Law Institute to create a federal securities code, a piece of legislation that would substitute for all the open-endedness that was being baked into securities regulation. Uh, and Loss and Milton Cohen and the, the brilliant minds that were pushing that had come to the conclusion you can't have insider trading without legislation or at least some template that goes beyond don't engage in fraud. Um, so the SEC had actually spent a lot of time in the latter half of the 70s working on potential legislation trying to find a way of articulating all of this. And as the drafters of the code came closer to having a work product that they wanted the SEC to endorse, um, that was becoming a more pressing issue. But there was one strong voice standing in opposition, and that was Stanley Sporkin, who was director of the Division of Enforcement, was very, opposed to any form of articulation, legislation that could be used to tie the hands of the SEC Enforcement Division. Stanley, as I recall, wasn't actually um, dedicated to parity of information so much as he liked the language of 10b-5 just as it was and didn't want anybody coming up with alternatives that would be more specific, um, that would tie the hands. And thus, for a variety of reasons, we never quite got to the place that Judge Rakoff has so many times urged um, of legislation that would substitute for the judicial decision making. Now to answer your question, which I can do much more quickly. Um, the day Chiarella came down, um, I had been working on the ALI code project involved in the negotiations about what insider trading should look like. Uh, so I was sort of brought into the working group on what do we do now? At the time, and this is mentioned in the Supreme Court's opinion, the SEC had a rulemaking proposal out to use section 14 of the Williams Act to create a specific tender offer rule. That was proposed, it hadn't been acted on. And inside the building, with again, Stanley Sporkin being the instigator, there was opposition to that form of articulation. So it was just hanging out there and it wasn't gathering steam inside the agency. Then of course, 
the opinion of the Supreme Court comes down. And now insider trading has been collapsed to something smaller than it used to be, a fiduciary-based um, theory of liability. Uh, what to do now? Um, the answer, uh, which we came up with in about a week, was a proposal that we were prepared in the general counsel's office to bring to the commission called 10BX, at least as its nickname, uh, which would be an immediate rule to codify the misappropriation theory of liability, plus the, what we now know is the classical theory of liability, to bring into a presumably enforceable rule, um, both the um, Berger theory and um, the Stevens theory of liability. Um, we brought that forward and inside the building was a cacophony of disagreement. Court Finn wanted their 14E rule, which was crafted in ways that made enforcement furious. Um, General Counsel was saying, we've got an opportunity. Justice Powell has said, one of the problems here is you haven't given enough notice. You haven't given enough clarity. Uh, we can solve all of this. Uh, enforcement saying, don't mess with our 10 b 5 any of you. Uh, and to quell that squabbling, the commission in a series of two meetings in May uh, 1980, basically said, let's get 14E3 out. Stop squabbling about everything else. Let's leave the misappropriation theory to the courts. And indeed, that's what happens. And that's a nice handoff uh, from me back to you uh, to bring the others in to tell the story of the misappropriation theory. So Don, one question before we go. Uh, was the commission discussion at the commission meeting particularly memorable? Did, was there unanimity? Was there different individual opinions of the commissioners? Um, or was it just, let's, let's, let's solve this problem and be done with it? Uh, there certainly would have been disagreement on what a comprehensive anti-misappropriation uh, anti rule uh, would have looked like. I drafted the 10 d 5 x and I tried to make it track uh, the Berger and Stevens articulation uh, as well as I could, um, but that was going to engender much too much infighting. Uh, I recall the commission being unanimous that the one most compelling objective to get to now is a tender offer rule with no confidence of anything else that would happen. Get a rule in articulated as a Williams Act rule um, such that um, Chiarella wouldn't apply. Um, and, and so that's the one thing uh, the commissioners were, were in agreement on. And, and that happened within two months of the decision. Pretty, pretty amazing. We, we, had, we had a memo in front of the commission in about a couple of weeks, I think, from, from the date of the decision. Uh, and, and so then it, then it goes back to the, uh, to the usual regime, to the prosecutors, to the, the front line, uh, including in the Southern District, which was right. the center of American finance then and still now. Uh, and so the question is, what would happen next? And it turns out that that Newman becomes the early vehicle for for how what it will look like. And Lee Richards, assistant U.S. attorney, was 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 located, ready to to take on that question. So let's turn to Lee, and and if you would, Lee, just tell us about what it was like to investigate, to draft the indictment, to think about how to eventually and and to eventually try the case uh, under this under this new world. Thank you, Professor. And uh, let me join the others in thanking Professor Nagy and all the sponsors. It's really wonderful to have this opportunity to reminisce about the Newman case, the investigation that led up to it and, and, and then what followed. I should say also that I'm, I've always been grateful to Judge Rakoff, who um, at the time was my boss at the uh, business frauds unit at the US Attorney's Office. Um, 
and made the uh, decision uh, for better or worse to assign me to what was then called the doctors and dentists case. It subsequently became the, known as the Newman case. Uh, the case had started, it, it actually had a, a wealth of factual puzzles that we had to work out um, uh, before we even got to the question of how to deal with the Chiarella decisions. It had begun at the New York Stock Exchange Surveillance Unit. They'd found a pattern of trading among a, a bunch of people living in Long Island, most of them doctors and dentists, uh, into 19 separate, uh, in the end of the day, 19 separate mergers and acquisition deals. Um, all of them linked to either Morgan Stanley as the investment banker or what was then called Kuhn Loeb and later became Lehman Brothers as the investment banker. Um, I was not on the case when it first arrived at the US Attorney's Office. Uh, a dear friend of ours, Larry Petowitz, um, uh, was the one who started work on it at the SEC and he was working with a, um, a really terrific SEC investigator named Lance Clifton. And they'd taken this pattern of low level apparent tippy trading and tried to move up the pyramid of trading to see who was at the very top of the pyramid. And they'd figured out that the fulcrum, if you will, was a guy named Jim Newman, who was a uh, sort of small time trader. And they discovered that um, Newman had a relationship with a man named Adrian Antonio. Antonio had worked at Morgan Stanley as an associate in the M&A group there uh, and then been moved out uh, and he ended up at Kuhn Loeb. Um, so that they, they identified him as a source but what was interesting, or one of the interesting things about the, uh, the scheme was that tips kept coming from Morgan Stanley after Antonio left. He also was tipping Kuhn Loeb deals, but he obviously had a source at Morgan Stanley after he departed. And so it fell to me and Lance um, when I first was assigned to the case to try to figure out who that source might be. And we spent weeks looking at the various bankers who worked on these deals trying to find some sort of pattern that would identify the guy who was tipping Antonio, who in turn was tipping Newman, um, and failed utterly. Until one day I, 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 I came into the office and Lance walked into my office and I said, Lance, why don't we take a look to see if there was any banker who didn't work on any of the deals? And um, after some legwork by Lance, it turned out that there was, and there was only one, and his name was Jacques Courtois. Um, so we finally found the, the very pinnacle of the trading uh, platform. But there were still other uh, tippees that were trading who we couldn't connect with either Newman or Antonio or Courtois initially. Um, and we tried to find patterns there and relationships there and, and failed until another SEC um, fellow, a, a guy named Jerry Marin, who was working with us, um, suggested that we look at the 1972, class of 1972 Facebook for the Harvard Business School. And, and you might wonder why we looked at that as a source. Well, it turns out that Antonio and Courtois had met at the Harvard Business School in the class of 72. And Jerry had the, the brilliant thought of seeing whether they had, they had any friends from that class who might be in our pyramid of traders. And sure enough, there were two guys, a guy named Glassman, and a fellow named Faribor's uh, Godar. So we were able to fill in um, the trading uh, uh, platform, if you're a pyramid, if you will, by, um, by the simple technique of looking at the Facebook from the class of 1972 at Harvard Business School. Um, I have to say that as a 30 year old prosecutor with absolutely no experience um, in investment banking of any kind, and one might ask uh, uh, Judge Rakoff why on earth he put me on the case when he has an opportunity, maybe he'll say something about that. But I was really fighting from behind. Um, in particular, I was trying to understand these deals and the jargon that was being used by investment bankers in these 19 separate deals. I was interviewing various bankers on the deals. I had to understand the, the 19 deals in order to make the argument, which we ultimately made that they were um, the, the source of the information. And I remember being troubled by the jargon. I mean, they talked about Iron Maidens and, and uh, White Knights and Bear Hugs. And I was struggling to figure these metaphors out as an uninitiated uh, young prosecutor. 
I had one particular meeting where I was talking with a, an associate from Morgan Stanley's in M&A department and trying to pin down the date of an uh, important meeting on one of the 19 deals. And I asked him if he could help me figure out what the date of that, that meeting might have been. I think I was trying to link it up with uh, tips that had subsequently occurred. And he looked at me and said, well, it, the night before the stones were in the garden. So I spent the next 10 minutes to myself wondering what on earth could the stones be and what was the metaphor of the garden? Well, he took me out of my misery by explaining that the night before he'd gone to a Rolling Stones concert at Madison Square Garden. Um, so that was one of the, the hurdles I had to get over working on the, on the uh, investigation. Having filled in the trading platform, we then needed to um, get enough evidence to bring charges. And we didn't have any witnesses and we had precious little documentary evidence other than this pattern of trading. Uh, we ended up putting an enormous amount of pressure on Mr. Antonio uh, through a variety of techniques, including subpoenaing people around him. And he eventually decided through his lawyer, Peter Leisure, who subsequently became a judge uh, in the Southern District um, to plead guilty and cooperate. So we had our witness, but once again, we didn't have enough to make charges. Uh, just the testimony of one witness trying to link this all up uh, was not likely to lead to conviction. So we had to look for more. And um, in particular, we had to figure out how we could corroborate uh, Antonio's uh, testimony about Courtois. He, for example, had uh, told us that the whole scheme had been hatched uh, over a chessboard and a couple of scotches at the Harvard Business, uh, excuse me, the Harvard Club in New York. Uh, that's when uh, Antonio had recruited Courtois to join the scheme. But we needed to try to prove uh, the truth of what Antonio was saying. Uh, Newman had done a lot of his trading uh, through Bahamian and Bermuda accounts. Um, back then it was uh, very difficult to get information out of uh, those kinds of bank accounts, but we were able to determine that the accounts had been financed uh, through the use of bearer US treasury bills. Um, the only evidence of those treasury bills were the serial numbers on them. There was no evidence uh, explaining who had deposited the bills into the accounts but we were able to trace those serial numbers back through a number of banks to the bank where the bills had been purchased. And I remember on Christmas Eve one year, uh, Lance walking into my office to say that we'd gotten the, uh, the production from that bank of the records they had. And not only had they kept track of the serial numbers, but they'd also kept track of the name of the purchaser of those treasury bills and it was Jacques Courtois, another sort of watershed moment in our investigation. Uh, which brings us uh, uh, to the question of how on earth we're gonna make these charges given the multitude or the multiple uh, opinions in the Chiarella decision. Uh, you will note that the case we had was information coming from investment banks that were representing the acquiring companies, not the target companies and therefore like the Chiarella case, we didn't have a chain of duty running uh, through the banks and the issuers to the target companies. Uh, only duty we could identify was a duty of confidentiality to the investment banks and through them to the investment bank clients, the acquiring companies. Um, and actually I remember a meeting with uh, Professor Longevoort to talk about the puzzle of how to make these charges. And we debated whether or not we should follow the Chief Justice's lead in his dissenting opinion in Chiarella and charge two theories, um, uh, namely the two theories that uh, Shapiro had argued in the Chiarella case, a theory that there was a duty breached not only to the acquiring companies, but also because the information had been stolen or misappropriated, uh, that duty was sufficient, that, that act of misappropriation was sufficient to create a duty to the selling shareholders. And after a fair amount of debate, we decided to shoot with a rifle and not have alternative theories. And I sat down with Justice Stevens' concurrence that has the most simple articulation of the misappropriation theory and drafted the indictment using the language from that concurrence. 
Um, and um, so that's, that's how we ended up um, uh, with the misappropriation, misappropriation theory and the Newman indictment. Um, we went ahead and returned the indictment, or I should say the grand jury did, and it was assigned to Judge Charles Haight, a wonderful judge in the Southern District of New York. I say that notwithstanding the fact that on motions of dis to dismiss, the judge decided to dismiss our indictment. And he did it on a fair notice theory. His theory was that Mr. Newman, who at the time was the only defendant on trial because everyone else uh, was li were living in uh, foreign lands, um, Judge Haight decided um, that Newman did not have fair notice that his conduct was a violation of 10b-5 or the mail fraud statute, which we had also charged, mail and wire fraud. Um, that was a blow, as you might imagine, um, but we repaired to the U.S. Attorney's Office and working with a bunch of really smart colleagues of mine, we uh, uh, prepared an appeal to the Second Circuit, which, was, which appeal was argued by the then U.S. Attorney uh, John Martin, um, much to my dismay. I would have liked to have Argue the opinion, the argued the case myself, but John obviously did a superb job, and indeed the Second Circuit reversed. And I've always thought that the real reason for the reversal was um, that we had pretty good evidence of scienter, pretty good evidence that the defendants knew they were doing something wrong. Uh, none of them traded, and none of the top-level uh, tippers and tippies traded in their own name. Newman and everyone above him traded through foreign bank accounts. And indeed, some of them used aliases in their dealings as some evidence of, of Sienter. And that evidence, I think, was sufficient to, uh, uh, to persuade the Second Circuit that indeed they'd had sufficient notice that their, um, their actions were wrongful and that that justified reversing Judge Haight's decision, sending it back to trial. Uh, and we tried it um, and uh, we're lucky enough to win. Um, and with that, I guess, Professor, I'll turn it back to you. Um, thanks, Lee. Uh, let's move on to the judge who, as you already heard, had a, a spread of time, spread of issues uh, of, of this space that he is, that he covered. Uh, so so uh, I'll, I'll turn the floor to Judge Rakoff to talk about any of those issues. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, a great privilege to be part of this program. I'm sorry uh, that I wasn't able to uh, plug into the uh, first half of the program because I'm conducting a jury trial in the uh, Southern District of New York. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, my court is continuing to have jury trials um, and I excuse the jury for one hour um, uh, so I could be part of this. Um, and I also want to mention at the outset that uh, I'm now at the age where I have an absolute perfect recollection <laughs> for things that never occurred. Um, uh, nevertheless, I will try my best uh, to be as accurate as possible. Um, and I want to make a point about Chiarella, a point about Newman, and a point about Carpenter. Um, so uh, Chiarella, the indictment came down in uh, uh, January of 1978, and uh, uh, the uh, very uh, excellent assistant U.S. attorney, Jack Lowe, who got the indictment, then went off into private practice just a few weeks uh, later, and that was followed by the departure of the uh, chief of the uh, fraud unit, uh, my hero, Rusty Wing, uh, uh, and so I was the new chief and I was stuck with this uh, uh, ball of wax. Um, uh, and uh, this may have come out in the first hour, I don't know. Uh, but we all viewed this as a test case. And we all viewed it as one where the, we clearly our first and foremost job was to win. Uh, we wanted to create uh, if possible, a broad precedent um, uh, that may in the end have come back to haunt us given the ultimate result, but it was not an unconscious uh, decision uh, based on Texas Gulf Sulphur, based on uh, internal discussions, including with uh, my boss, Bob Fisk. Um, we 
uh, uh, wanted to uh, create a broad criminal liability for what we all saw as the scourge of insider trading. So uh, we get reversed. Uh, and uh, meantime, um, uh, I had assigned the doctor's case to, uh, I thought, Lee, I signed it to you because you were the smartest guy in the unit. Uh, the, uh, and, and I trust you won't disagree with that. Um, so um, uh, Lee, of course, did a fantastic job. Um, and uh, the, uh, I want to just pick up on one point that Lee mentioned just in passing, which is we added a mail fraud and wire fraud count. Uh, Chiarella as a test case had been brought just under 10 B5. Um, but uh, there was a feeling then, which I think is uh, still shared uh, by many prosecutors today, that there's greater flexibility in uh, mail fraud and wire fraud. And therefore it's always uh, a useful uh, addition to have. Um, uh, and that, uh, it uh, brings me to when Newman went up to the Second Circuit um, and uh, the office was victorious. There was a dissent by District Judge Dumbald uh, who said uh, uh, that he wasn't dissenting on the mail fraud wire fraud, but he was dissenting on the securities fraud because he didn't believe that uh, embezzling information from a uh, company uh, was in connection with the purchase and sale of securities. So that was the so-called in connection issue. Um, and that continued to haunt uh, this area of the law for several years. I went into uh, private practice uh, and I was very fortunate that Don Buckwald, who represented the Wall Street Journal reporter, uh, Foster Winans, who was accused of insider trading on a misappropriation theory, brought me in to represent uh, his, what in those days we called roommates. Uh, today, we'd be much more direct. This was his uh, homosexual lover, David Carpenter. Uh, and it was a great privilege to, to represent David. Um, and uh, the, uh, we always thought, Don and I, that uh, the in-connection issue was a major issue. Um, and lo and behold, the Supreme Court granted cert. Uh, we had lost in the district court, although uh, uh, a really quite fine bench opinion by Judge Stewart, uh, that gave us uh, a number of things that were useful. Um, and then uh, we lost two to one in the second circuit, but with a dissent that emphasized the in connection issue. Uh, and then the Supreme Court granted uh, certiorari. Um, however, we still had to deal with the uh, mail fraud. Uh, and we had some hope that we might have a good argument there because of an intervening Supreme Court case called McNally, which had restricted mail fraud to money and property uh, and had rejected the so-called intangible rights theory uh, of the mail fraud statute. Uh, well, we were dealing here with an intangible information, uh, but it wasn't exactly an intangible right. So, the case goes to the Supreme Court and uh, the, the Carpenter case, and uh, the court splits four to four on the in connection issue, which affirmed the convictions, but had no precedential effect. Now, an interesting footnote, um, the reason it was four to four was that Justice Powell had resigned but he had resigned after hearing oral argument. Many years later, when Elena Kagan was at her confirmation hearing, 
she had to turn over to the Senate all the memos she wrote as a law clerk during that very term for Thurgood Marshall. And in her um, memo to Thurgood Marshall about the Carpenter case, she recites that the initial vote is five to four for reversal on the in connection issue. So had Justice Powell not resigned, um, the entire law of insider trading would have taken a, another hit, if you will, uh, at least so far as 10B5 was concerned, uh, because it would have been five to four in saying this is not in connection with the purchase and sale of securities. Um, uh, uh, as it was, it was four to four. And years later in the O'Hagan case, the Supreme Court said that this was uh, in connection with the purchase and sale of securities. But it shows how, frankly, happenstances can make history. Um, on the other issue, on the mail fraud, wire fraud issue, we lost eight to nothing. Um, and the court held that, uh, yes, information is intangible, but it's still a form of property, uh, uh, which I think uh, was the right decision, though, of course, uh, my client had, and, and Don's client were disappointed. Um, the last point I would make is the one that Don alluded to. I was troubled even a little bit as a prosecutor. I was troubled more as a defense counsel. And I was particularly and have been particularly troubled as a judge by the fact that so much of the law in this area has been judge made. Now that's fine when you're talking about civil liability only, but when you're talking about criminal liability, the law of the United States from virtually uh, the beginning has been that only Congress can determine what is a criminal violation. And so there continues to be, in my opinion, a huge need for legislation uh, in this area. Uh, from time to time, Congress has flirted with um, uh, legislation, but so far they haven't passed uh, anything. Uh, but I'm sure as soon as the uh, little problem with the election is over, which will only take, what, uh, six months or so, um, uh, uh, we can uh, hopefully I see a Congress that will address this issue. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, just a, a question um, in in thinking about the uh, uh, whether or not to pursue the uh, which theory to pursue, and you you said Chiarella um, didn't have mail fraud and wire fraud, or, or that, that was that was that was not that was that was not the case. Um, what, what might have made it uh, that likely not, not to go the double route? And because as you said in Carpenter, the government ended up winning because the two cases were there and, and, the, and the securities case was split 4-4 four, four and, and the mail fraud, wire, mail fraud, wire fraud uh, resulted in a, in a win for the government. Um, why, why not do that in Chiarella as well? Well, I don't know the answer from personal knowledge because uh, Jack Lowe was the one who put together the indictment, although it was tried brilliantly by John Sifford. Um, and Rusty was the chief uh, uh, at the time the indictment was brought down. Uh, but I uh, uh, am cognizant because Rusty told me when he handed over the reins to me that this was intended to be a test case. And I think that um, the, uh, 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 there was a feeling that the securities laws were the area where the test should be brought, so to speak. But I don't know more than that uh, from personal knowledge. And, and if there were not a, a, a result on the securities part, it wouldn't serve that function if that in fact was what was well, at least that may have been what was in their mind. Uh, I mean, my own feeling is uh, I've, I've 
always been a big fan of the mail fraud, wire fraud statute as the uh, backstop when all else fails. It has its problems uh, in that regard as well. Uh, the fair notice aspects that were uh, alluded to previously, uh, but it is a very flexible statute. Um, and uh, so uh, my own view when I became chief uh, was to urge the assistance to add mail fraud and wire fraud. Um, and that has waxed and waned over the years, but it's come back in recent years as well. But was there a sense of, uh, of, of, of part of the process to talk with the SEC about questions like that? Or is that something that the, the Southern District U.S. Attorney felt comfortable with making, making the call? So again, um, uh, all I know is from Rusty, and Rusty tells me he did not discuss that with uh, Stanley Sporkin. Um, the... Uh, I used to have fairly uh, frequent telephone calls with Stanley, uh, but uh, they were mostly of the following nature. Uh, Hi, Stanley. Hi, Jed, but why haven't you brought that case yet? Uh, (laughs) So that was the the nature of the conversations. If I may, Professor. um, Please do. I, I, I noted earlier, but just to put a point on it, uh, Don and I did talk, um, and Don reminded me by email that we actually met uh, before I finished drafting the indictment. And, um, and, and there was a lively debate between us about uh, whether uh, to uh, articulate a misappropriation argument on two, bron- two prongs, the way the Chief Justice had suggested, or, or simply on the what's now become the misappropriation theory, namely, a violation of duty to the banks and the acquiring companies. Um, And um, I don't know whether uh, Don agrees with the, or or agreed at the time with our decision to just go with the Justice Stevens concurrence, but uh, I do recall now that we we had an interesting discussion about it. I had been sent up uh, with the hope that both theories would be pled, but after the discussions with Lee um, and, and, he emphasized the need to have the rifle focused, uh, the, the rifle focused on a single idea that a judge and jury could wrap their mind around. It, it, it made sense. Um, I've always wondered what would have happened had we gone uh, in the other direction. You had been sent up on the train to New York to talk about that. Um, and, and you made that trip and, and um, had that discussion. We had that discussion, yes. It was fruitful. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, there's been discussion, including in the SEC uh, Historical Society oral history, about uh, the, the Chiarella arguments by the government and Frank Easterbrook's um, oral history includes about why they, how, that the government was playing the long game, that at least the SG's office was playing the long game. And, and uh, it, it, which means, they they didn't they did not support the second circuit the reasoning given by the second circuit below they didn't support the reasoning given by Texas Health Software uh, they they introduced this different theory that caused the problem with the the uh, the charge to the jury uh, of a misappropriation uh, and and so I think that that created a different space didn't it? When, it, when it, when the Supreme Court came to decide. And so they played for the long, the long, long game was to, to let misappropriation percolate, which it did. Uh, the long game might have been longer than they thought. <laughs> uh, but to some extent, the, uh, uh, there was also a long game going on. I mean, it, 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 uh, it took until O'Hagan, which was 17 years later. Um, and I think uh, Stevens was still around, but not Powell or, or any of the, any of the others, um, and so and so. It, I'm not sure it's uh, Judge Rakoff mentioned happenstance, but it's it's also something about a couple of sides playing the long game. Does does that resonate with the three of you, any of you at all, or or no? I it, it's a risky long game. Uh, you know, I I think. 
we have to acknowledge that Frank Easterbrook, brilliant guy that he is, um, had a vision of insider trading that he wanted to push forward, which is based on private property in substitution for open-ended things like duties to the marketplace. Uh, so uh, I think he was playing multiple games um, in, in structuring this. We have to remember that two courts of appeals, federal courts of appeals um, rejected the misappropriation theory. Um, both on federalism grounds, which were gradually, gradually resonating more and more with the Supreme Court as we went on. Um, so the long game was not without its risks. I guess I'd have to say that um, when it came to prosecuting uh, Newman, we were playing the short game. Um, we wanted to win the case. Um, following uh, uh, Judge Rakoff's uh, guidance, we wanted to make sure we won it by putting mail fraud and wire fraud in, in order to deal with the burn bomb in connection with problem. Um, and, um, and, and as I've said, we wanted to make sure the theory under 10b-5 was as clear as it could be. Um, and so that I would, I would think of our process is a short game, not a long game, even though it took a while. <laughs> I recall that um, Andy Fry, who was with the Solicitor General's office, was the one person who called me uh, when the government was putting together its uh, uh, brief in Chiarella. Um, and uh, I didn't speak to, to Frank Easterbrook or anyone else on that. But Andy basically said to me, uh, we don't think we can win in the Supreme Court uh, with the theory uh, that you guys espouse your broad theory. Um, uh, and uh, so we're going to see what else we can uh, uh, come up with. Um, the, um, I asked him why um, do you think any, I, I, this may be not totally verbatim, but the gist of it was they defer to Powell and Powell hates insider trading prosecutions. Now that's a gross <laughs> exaggeration, but but uh, it was something in along those lines. But it, but it may be right. <laughs> uh, in the first panel, uh, Stanley Arkin talked about the certiorari petition and the decision to go for certain, saying you can't, you never expect to get it. And neither Newman or Carpenter, any any recollection of either any of uh, I guess. Uh, Judge can speak to both, but but Lee can speak to Newman. D did you contemplate it might go to the, the court, the Supreme Court? Well, um, in Carpenter, Don Buckwald, uh, when he was kind enough to uh, bring me in to represent David Carpenter, uh, said, I mean, it, it, Don was being paid uh, by the Wall Street Journal uh, under their bylaws because Foster was uh, entitled to that, even though uh, the theory was he had violated their trust. Uh, Carpenter uh, was going to be pro bono. So in an effort to uh, convince me that I ought to get involved in this case, he said, but I'm sure it's going to the Supreme Court. <laughs> now, whether he was serious or not, I don't know, but it proved to be the case. In Newman, I, I, I think um, uh, we, we again thought the mail fraud, wire fraud charges were, were gonna be um, at least our salvation. And we obviously hoped that the Second Circuit opinion would be affirmed if cert were granted, but luckily it was not from our point of view. Uh, we are coming to the end of our time. Any any closing thoughts from any of the three of you in in uh, in in sixty seconds or less, thirty seconds or less? That that doesn't give you much of a window to work with. So so I think given that, uh, I, I please join me in thanking our three panelists and all the panelists and the planners of this conference who've done a wonderful job. Uh, and with our thanks to the. SEC Historical Society, to the Pollock Center NYU, and to Indiana University Meyer Law School. Uh, we will, we will uh, 
all be the beneficiaries of what they put together. And with that, <clears throat> we will adjourn.